Ja. And we are live. Welcome everyone to a new episode of Electric Podcast. I'm Fred Lambert, your host. And this week I'm coming to you live from Paris. So that's why uh, we are coming in a little bit earlier for uh, most of you because, well, for everyone actually. <laughs> but uh, on the East Coast, the people on the East Coast, it's uh, not that your usual 4 p.m. Um, we're going to test it out for a few weeks, uh, see how it goes like that, and then we'll adjust if we need to. But as Jules said, because it's coming live from New York. How's it going in New York, set? It's nice. Probably not Paris nice, though. Yes, it's starting to get cold already. A little bit cold. Yeah. It's not that hot here in Paris, though. It's not, we do have some kind of winter over here. I'm you got a tr tropical tree behind you, so I'm thinking it's, it's a lot warmer. Yeah. I am in a house. <laughs> All right. So big week this week to talk about uh, Tesla news and a few other topics, but mainly Tesla because they had a big week this week, starting with, of course, the delivery and production result that came out on Wednesday. And uh, yeah, if you've been following Electric on that one, you probably already have a good idea uh, of, um, you had a good idea ahead of time because we reported, of course, last week that Elon said that they had a chance, you know, chance at reaching uh, 100,000 deliveries in the quarter. But on Monday, we also reported that based on our sources, they were still a few thousand shorts short at the end of a uh, within just a day left in the whole quarter so that wasn't looking great and uh sure enough tesla released the numbers on wednesday saying that they let over ninety-seven thousand car during the quarter which is still a delivery record if you guys remember the quarter before that which was also a delivery record it was ninety-five thousand cars so an increase on that front and big increase also in production 87,000 cars were produced in Q2. In Q3, it is 96,155, I believe. Exactly. So that's a big increase uh, on that front. Also, uh, they confirm an increase in net orders from uh, from Q, uh, Q2 to Q3, and they're going to enter Q4 with a bigger backlog of orders, which is also nice. Um, of course, Last week, we reported based on the email that Elon sent out to employees that he said they were tracking for 110,000 net orders for the quarter. So that backlog could be quite significant going into Q4. And now with that higher production capacity, on top of potentially having the uh, Gigafactory 3 production capacity to whatever levels it would be by the end of the, by the, end of the year, Tesla is set for another, in my opinion, record quarter in q4 yeah. so if we look at uh, what happened here exactly definitely not a demand issue i know we come back to this always because there's always some kind of rumors as tesla is having some demand problem peak demand and whatnot definitely not the issue here it looks again like an inventory delivery uh bottleneck here in this case because what we're hearing from specific markets here is that if the inventory was better distributed, the production inventory was better distributed at the end of the at the end of the quarter, Tesla could have probably uh, reached over a hundred thousand units. Uh, places like the Netherlands, which had a record quarter with over seven thousand deliveries, they have uh, an incentive, an even incentive that's ending by the end of the year, so they're still good for Q4, and that's what boosting orders uh, in the market. But so Tesla had a record quarter there, but they, they still have a ton of orders to fulfill in Q4, and they had them apparently before the end of the quarter too. So they, if they had the inventory there, they could have probably uh, got a, a lot more deliveries there. Places that like the UK too, we are hearing they are uh, inventory uh, restricted there. So if Tesla would have made, not just in the UK, but more uh, write and drive Model 3s in general, they could have probably helped because I, I think Australia also could have used, they got, they got a big shipment or something like 2,000 units, but apparently they could have used a bigger shipment. So um, something else to watch out in, Q, um, in Q4. Do you have any prediction for Q4, Seth? Uh, I think they'll hit 100. Uh, notably, you know, it's the holiday shopping quarter. Also, um, 
Tesla's last uh, quarter with the federal tax credit, any federal tax credit in the U.S. Uh, so a lot of people, even though it's only eighteen hundred something dollars, for the Model uh, Three, that might be a bigger difference for people. Yeah, I think that's still a notable amount of money, and I think uh, why not buy it with that rather than in Q1 without that. It might be hard for. I think Tesla is going to hit over a hundred Q4. I think it's probably a foregone conclusion. The question is, do they keep that kind of number up indefinitely, or do they hit another drop in January under a hundred thousand? Oh, I think a drop is coming in January, but it, it will still probably beat uh, Q2, Q, Q3 numbers that we're getting now. I think because I think that when you say, uh, are you? Are you just being like conservative? I think over a hundred thousand because it could be over a hundred thousand could be a hundred and fifty thousand. We don't. <laughs> it could be if they can make that money. Yeah, so that that's a question I think because I think they're gonna see higher demand across the board in most market in Q four versus Q three, but it won't be that big of a of higher demand here. I think the biggest change is gonna be China with the start of Chinese made Model 3, I think the demand here is quite high, especially since Tesla has been taking orders on Chinese made Model 3 for, for months now. So the question is more going to be about the um, production capacity of Gigafactory 3, just how many cars they're going to put out in, in Q4. And that, that your guess is as good as mine here. It could be a thousand, it could be 10,000. I have no idea. So, whatever they make during that time. But the more they make in Gigafactory 3, the more it's helping all other markets because then it frees up uh, production capacity in uh, Fremont that was normally used for shipment to China. They use that for uh, production capacity elsewhere, which is going to be probably easier to deliver quickly um, by the end of the year than uh, in uh, further out markets like, like China. Uh, so so we, we could see a big logistic improvement from that. But of course, it all depends on how many Model 3s can come out of the Gigafactory 3. So is it going to contribute just a handful or is it going to contribute a few thousand, which would be more significant? Um, at one point, they were talking about three thousand a week by the end of the year. So, but they always been way out of the with those with those um, estimate before. So I wouldn't bet too much on that. All right. Other big thing this week uh, was the summon feature, smart summon feature that um, Elon called it Tesla's most viral feature, and I think that's fair. Uh, he released the numbers actually said in the first few days over half a million five hundred fifty thousand uh, smart summon trips smart summon use have been have been completed uh, which is quite significant uh, however a few of those uses that have ended in, in, in crashes and uh, <clears throat> so the feature itself I've seen viral use but it also went viral in the more common sense that on social media and everything. I'm probably sure that most of those users were not actual like people using the feature for a functional purpose. I think it was people trying it, trying the feature for the first time or the second time, whenever, just testing it. And uh, a lot of those people were, were testing it for their for their social media because they've been posting their video everywhere of, of those uh, of smart summon tries. And again, a few of them, and then it crashes or, or near miss crash or kind of a suspicious uh, situation. So we, we reported on those earlier this week saying that uh, like people are doing dumb things with smart summon, which isn't always smart, by the way. It's also the feature itself can, can be dumb. So <laughs> something to take into account. Things like using the feature in extremely crowded parking lot situation is, is not ideal at all. Like. It is pretty good. It is impressive in many ways, but you're pushing it to its limit by trying it in, in the parking lot that's full of people. The situation like the people with pushing carts, um, children running around, things like that. Just, just, just not ideal. Also, people doing it without the car within their line of sight. We've seen plenty of those. You're not supposed to do that 
the year because when you activate the smart summon, you're supposed to hold. Well, you, it is the only way to make it work. You're holding onto the button to make it work. And if you let go of that button, it's like what do you call it? A denman switch? Is that it? Yeah. A denman switch. If you let it go, it's supposed to stop, but you, that's only useful if you see what the car is doing. Um, so yeah, it's only, seen, only as useful as your internet connection as well. That too. <laughs> and uh, we've seen also yep. people testing the object detection feature of the, the smart summon, meaning they throw themselves for the car or whatnot. So don't do that too. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we've seen the people do that with autopilot before at higher speed. At least yeah. smart summon is not that fast. So Right. I mean, I think te Tesla is kind of betting on like all the screw ups are going to be so slow that it's not going to be a big deal. But clearly, uh, they're going to probably get some lawsuits about wrecked cars. I, I, I'm just assuming here. Um, the, the language is clear. The language is clear. It's like the pilot. They are responsible for it. And that's why they should always be uh, within the line of sight and ready to let go of the button. Yeah, but what if you let go of the button and it continues another couple of feet and crashes into a wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's uh, that's the thing that always people were talking about with the autopilot crashes. Like we people were uh, were looking for a crash where it's just not just the autopilot failing, but autopilot like causing yeah, right. just, just not like not seeing the lines and 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 going over or something like that. It was actually like jerking the car really fast into the a ditch or something, but we've never really seen that happen. Of course, Tesla is also like limitation on what autopilot can do in terms of or how um, strong of a movement it can do. So, but anyway, so we've seen a bunch of that and NHTSA confirmed that they are looking into those incidents. Um, the, this of course is the American uh, transport regulator. And they, they said that they're in contact with Tesla to, to talk about uh, those incidents. Of course, I assume that NHTSA uh, had to approve uh, of the, at least it was part of the discussion to approve that, that feature to some degree, because Tesla said that they were waiting for regulators at one point. So I know there's a bunch of different regulators in the US, but. Yeah. Anyway, anyway so so wait, I, get, I have some news. I have gotten V10 on my Model X and I mm -hmm. tried and I tried the uh, um, Smart Summon and it okay. worked. It worked great, but the car drove off the driveway into the grass a little bit. I don't know if that's uh, within the realm of like success or failure, but uh, were you in the you know, grass? What did you do? Come to no, me? I was like in front of the garage, and the car was like a, you know down the driveway a little bit. Clearly, wasn't for any good purpose. It was just to test out the feature. Yeah. Um. So all it had to do was kind of roll straight, and it kind of rolled off the driveway. A little bit and then back onto the driveway. I don't know. I mean, it, it was, it was more great other than that, so it came to you. Yeah, that... it came and worked. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, it was a little disconcerting that it, it went off the driveway, but uh, you know, it's in beta, it's in beta. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. That's the main complaint about the the feature itself is that people don't see that much use to it. Like, what can you do with the with, with the feature? For the most part, what it looks to me is like it's something that Tesla can release within the con the confine of current regulations, and, and you know it works on private property. So that's how the point really. Right. Right. And speaking of the other uh, post that we had about Smart Cement this week was that. Uh, drag times the the big youtuber that uh, often posts about uh, his tesla ownership experience and especially the higher end tesla which he, he drags race hence the name drag times um they were testing the smart summon and they got pulled over by um, a police officer so they were testing it in a private parking lot an empty parking lot so uh, i commend them for that i hate when i see those people doing it and very uh busy parking lot but they were doing it and what i don't like they were doing it in the, the parking lots where they have roadways with stop signs and everything smart someone is not made to indulge stop signs like it's just a regular parking lot situation where you don't really don't have a stop sign so they did that and it ran the stop sign sure enough cops saw it pulled the car over 
almost too perfect to be true, which of course is leading a lot of people thinking that it was staged, which is, in my opinion, likely, though there's, it's hard to confirm. 100% staged, 100%. Yeah, it's very staged. Uh, some people claim to have talked to the, the police officer in question who said it was staged. First of all, was it was the guy paid or something? Did the police officer have time to take out because he, he had the real patrol car and everything? So yeah, it looked like a real patrol car. Yeah, it looked like hopefully off duty. Everything. So, I don't know. Yeah, hopefully right. Right, but uh, drag times doesn't admit to anything to, anything to have staged it. Either way, the, the the situation could be a real scenario, though. We were, so that, that that that's a point of the whole thing. It could be a real scenario. However, I think in most jurisdictions, police officers they don't enforce traffic laws in private properties like parking lots. Though, I'm not that to say that you shouldn't follow those uh, traffic laws, but I'm not sure they can, uh, other than uh, some like uh, endangerment, like things like that, uh, which. Uh, maybe running a stoplight could could fall into that i'm not sure either way then brooks from drag times was saying who gets the parking ticket is it the car or is it me of course it's him so that was the only relevant question if it, people actually had that question of course it's him like everything in tesla's literature about the feature makes it clear that you're responsible for the car and uh that's why there's a dead man switch so you should get a ticket. Of course, he didn't get a ticket. Does that have something to do with the officer being off duty and the whole thing being staged? You be the judge of that. It would have I been think... cool at the end if the the officer just started stripping, like a uh, at a strip party or something, because <laughs> it seemed very fake. And even the officer didn't seem real. But I, you know, that patrol car definitely did look real. Yeah. The only thing, like, uh, what what made me think that it wasn't staged. It's like everyone that was saying stage was saying it was staged. It's like they're like, oh, there was a, a, a GoPro in the car. Like, of course it's a GoPro in the car. The guy, the guy is filming a YouTube video about testing right. the smart like hundreds of thousands of other people. So that was like that's not a, uh, why it's staged, but you're right, there's other things that, that points to it being staged. The reaction of the police officer amongst other things. The police officer himself saying, who do I give the ticket to? Like right. Who cares? Like you, you can give the ticket to the driver, or you can just assign the, the police officer can also assign the tickets to the car, and then the car owner is asked to pay it. So either way, it, it's coming to the car owner. It's not like he's gonna contact Tesla and say, "Oh, your Tesla software was in charge." And no, nah, you would have never thought that. So so weird. Anyway, moving on. Another big news of the week was uh, another Tesla acquisition. This hasn't confirmed it yet, but it looks like uh, it, it, it's very much happening. Was first reported by CNBC, but then confirmed by the CEO of the of the company in question. The startup is called DeepScale, and um, it's basically a AI startup focused on deep neural network with a focus on computer vision. So deep neural network for computer vision. You can imagine why Tesla would want. A company like that it looks like a relatively small company uh, in the development phase though they did came out with a few different products relating to, to uh, deep neural nets and including a computer vision just vision system for um, self-driving car or, or at least to deploy autonomous features inside inside vehicles and their whole focus from what we can tell is on extremely power computing power and overall power efficient deep neural nets uh which also has been a focus from tesla the it's the whole point of building their um self-driving chip to be able to increase the computational power in the car while limiting the power efficiency so they don't want a chip that just consumes a lot of power um and we're gonna get into that a little uh, later too in the podcast but Regarding the uh, deep um, deep scale uh, acquisition, it basically looked like what people call, I think, an uh, acquire. Is that it? Acquire. Yeah, acquire. Acquire, where uh, they buy the company not for much for their business for 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 their um, products, but for the talent itself. So the the people building the company. Uh, 
the CEO of um, of Deep Scale Forest, Hien Hien Dollar, Hien Dollar. Um, has officially joined Tesla as a senior staff uh, machine learning scientist, and uh, all this staff is uh, uh, allegedly gonna gonna join him. He uh, he has a PhD in electrical engineering from UC Berkeley, and so so the idea is that right now the the market for AI people and especially deep learning people and computer vision people the the, the, the market is extremely competitive because there's just a ton of company investing a ton of money uh, to to get that to market because it's a game changer of course uh, self driving cars. And we've seen, especially Tesla, having a product delivered to market, it's it makes them a prime target for for poaching. Like a lot of people in the Autopad team have been poached by company from Nvidia to GM to uh, Google uh, Zwemo project, Cruise and whatnot, and Lyft. I should say I said Cruise twice, I think. <laughs> um, not that doesn't mean that Tesla hasn't been good at acquiring talent. Yeah, they they had a ton of talent and they still have. But acquiring a team like that helps a lot too, uh, to to bring a bunch of talent in just one go, and uh, presumably they're going to be working under under uh, Caperdi, who's been for the last two years at Tesla's head of AI in, uh, in computer vision. So I see the good news. They haven't disclosed anything like the numbers in terms of uh, how much it costs. Uh, but again, like I said, the company seemed relatively small. The last we heard of them in terms of fundraising was a fifteen million round. Uh, earlier this year, that was a Series A. So normally you have um, some kind of like, um, what do you call it? Like the very first round you, ra you raised, uh, like just there's a word for that. I don't know what it is, but uh, so you're trying to imagine a value for it? Yeah, yeah I'm trying to because Series A is the first like official round, but before right. that, there's another. Uh, oh, Angel? Just. Or, like uh, a, a from investor and family and stuff like just like you're right. pulling some money together to get the startup going and then you go for a real like professional full uh, uh, capital raise which was 15 million so that doesn't without knowing the percentage of the company that they sold for that 15 million there's no way to say how much it's worth but I would find it hard to believe that it's worth anything more than 50 million dollars or something like that that would be uh, surprising to me at this at this stage at least. And did they they buy it with stock or did they buy it with cash or that's the, that's a we don't we don't know we really don't know it would be very nice if they bought them with stocks yep and, uh, and the stocks was uh, divided through uh, throughout the staff uh, since it's not acquired apparently uh, that way the staff has uh, an incentive to to keep working at Tesla and deliver deliver that uh, elusive self driving product. But yeah, exciting things on that front for sure. Either way, All right? We um, looking at the V10 up update. We saw the sub updated the language about the well, not not just Sentry mode, but um, data sharing. So if you go into your settings option, sorry, your setting option, and then you go to safety and security, I think there's a data sharing tab. You click on that, and then you have to accept it. Uh, I think we haven't seen it updated because in the US when they do update that, it does they, they don't it doesn't prompt it to you. At least I didn't see it on my update. I don't know if you saw it on yours. I didn't. But they started pushing it to Europe apparently. I haven't heard of anything other than one source that sent to me. I would uh, thank uh, Fabian. Fabian. Yeah, you he know got, what? I yeah. I wonder if it's related to GDPR, like uh the data sharing uh regulations in your yeah, yeah that's, my, that's my that's my thinking so but what, what people haven't heard much about about it is because i think Fabien is like one of the only ones to have, to have received v10 in europe he was himself surprised to get the update in france and but when they get the update they have uh, the um uh, the new terms for data sharing that shows up so you have to accept it and he did point out to us that there were some changes relating to sentry mode where Tesla now says that the because all this data sharing Tesla takes and apparently does increase with v10 too where they, they pull a lot more clips from your cars now just using the camera they pull more clips to 
uh, improve their neural net system and uh, leading to full cell driving. But they always say that your VIN number is not attached to to those um, video clips so that it's, there's no uh, privacy issues um, regarding to like employees just like spying on certain uh, people uh, by looking up their VIN and uh, seeing what they're up to. However, for Sentry Mode, let's just say that they are linking the video clips to your VIN number as a backup system for 72 hours. So there was already some language about that, but it was all clarified now. They do match your VIN for 72 hours, which means that technically, if someone were, was to break into your car and they knew about Sentry Mode and they still your um, flash drive on which the footage is recorded, then you would have no way to see what happened and try to track that thief and give the information to the police and whatnot. So Tessa says that that won't be the case because they will beam that to, I don't know how quick they can do that, don't know what I think of it, but uh, they, they would beam that to their like cloud storage basically, and they will keep it for 72 hours. So you could technically reach out to them, I assume though. So <laughs> yeah, that would be a nightmare. I mean, unless somebody was like killed or something, but also uh, it's interesting, does that data, get beamed immediately or is that when you hit Wi-Fi? Because uh, I can't imagine that Tesla is uploading a lot of videos over AT&T's network in the US yeah. and, and the other. Here's the thing, I would imagine. Yeah. and I see some confusion about that. Because most people, when they, they, come, they activate their sentry mode, they go back to their car and they see like, what depending on where the car was parked, they see one or two or sometimes 10, 20, 30, um, Sentry mode events. It's not for every sentry mode events. They only do it for alarm state events, which means okay. there's, we explained that early on when Tesla released the sentry mode, because there's different state of sentry mode where the car is just recording, when the car is showing um, an alert on the, on, the, on, the, on the screen, and when there's an actual alarm that starts because it detects what Tesla referred to as a severe threat. Um, here's the thing we've never seen that happen myself or for other than the people actually like banging on the windows or actually breaking the windows and getting inside the car so that's the point if someone gets your drive they had to get inside the car so they had to break inside the car so hopefully the alarm state of sensible would have triggered and the uh, the video would have been to the cloud, but like you said, there's some question about like when did it, does it be like because it would have to be almost instantly because the video was recorded right before uh, the time that we would. Uh, well, you could actually remove the drive and then keep recording, but oh yeah, if they don't steal the car, like no, normally we're talking about a breaking scenario where you're breaking and still inside the car, they don't really trying to steal the car, right? Though not impossible, but less likely. So yeah, that's the good news. And Tesla says that they could also use that footage just for general improvement in sentry mode. So some people have been um, speculating that Tesla is not just looking at the like very basic information of seeing people coming in, we start recording and whatnot, but they could actually detect track, tr tr detect threats to the car in different ways. We've seen, of course, the third party application of someone that, um, can detect licenses and cars, um, not 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 licenses, but plates, uh, plates number on, on cars, and then can determine the pattern of people following you, being tracked, and whatnot. Very CIA type of deal. Yeah. All right. Now we're gonna move into some pattern application that Tesla had this week, and us seeing some kind of patterns in the patents application if patent patterns patterns in the patent applications um they add first off a, a seat a new seat design with a temperature control system inside the seat which sounds like a liquid cooled 
liquid cooled and liquid heated or no no the uh, eating part is elements so it's not liquid heated yeah so liquid cool and element heated system that is more compact and more power efficient and that's going to be the team here power efficiency so if you remember back a few months back we reported on tesla basically reinventing the wiper with like a magnetic wiper system that was also supposed to be more efficient more power efficient so it's, it seems like this is sort of a focusing on the power efficiency of their subsystem and components. We know that Tesla is already basically the king of efficiency for long-range electric vehicles, and that's mainly due just to the efficiency of the actual electric powertrain, which is the most important part, and things like aerodynamic performance and, and the weight of the cars, too. But there's plenty of other power-consuming part components inside the car. Of course, they are all way less consuming than an actual power train like the force to move the car is once it's more power consuming of course but if you can make a bunch of small improvement like things like in the seats like that you can, you, you can improve the overall efficiency of the cars and uh, of the car and increase range especially if you reduce just the weight of those things but you, well, there's those. There's also the phenomena, or I don't know if you do this, but if you see like your, your range is getting a little bit low, then maybe you're gonna not use your your eating or your cooling in the car. You're not gonna use your heated seats or your cooling seats. So now, if you have a system like that that is supposedly less power demanding, maybe you you would still use them uh, if you see your range reducing a lot. So. Or the, the point about the, the the pattern the pattern and the patents application is that we saw that one and we also saw a new power um, a new steering power assist system that uh, all electric power assist steering system with a high uh, reduction gear ratio that Tesla claims to be smaller and more efficient than their current system so that would also um, reduce overall power consumption and could cool, cool increase the efficiency of the entire car um so power assist steering these days uh you either have full electric ones and uh hydraulic ones and hydraulic assist ones there's also the, the steer by wire thing but i don't think any car right now uh, at least in the us can have a steer by wire so tesla is designing an all electric one that would apparently be uh, uh, more power efficient However, you can go, we posted all details of the whole thing on, on Electric, but it goes into deep details that I, I go a bit over my head on that front because very technical. Keeping on the patent application fronts, just earlier today, we posted about Tesla filing a patent for basically a bezel-less screen. Um, <laughs> Sounds a little bit like the waterfall screens that we see on like uh, we've seen on like Samsung phones for a little while. Basically, the 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 edge of the screen creates a kind of holographic effect that that makes the the pixels seem to go like right to the edge. Mm -hmm. um, which which uh, you know if they're doing a different method than Samsung and and the other. Uh, I think LG. Oh, but you think they are because they are filing a patent for it. But what you just described uh, sounds very similar to what is described in, in, in that thing. But again, we're talking about extremely technical stuff. Uh, uh, the guy that that is listed as the inventor for the patent at Tesla, at Tesla Christoph Gugusi, Gugusi, Gugusis. I thought that, that was like a French French name. You should be able to. Yeah, well, it's a, there's a French name and there's a French name. <laughs> uh, in Quebec, I don't, I've never heard of anyone named uh, Gugu Cis. Gugu Cis. I'm so sorry, uh, Christos. I'm messing up your, messing up your name. Uh, he's a Tesla uh, senior staff engineer. Guy seems like a genius. I mean, if, his, resume is, um, his resume is as good as it gets. I mean, he has a PhD in physics from Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris. Uh, he's an expert in quantum physics. Before joining Tesla in 2016, he worked for Saint Jobin, which is a glass supplier for Tesla, and he developed a bunch. He has a bunch of patent there for uh, different type of glass and tin films uh, on glass, which is relevant to this patent because, uh, like you said, they're losing. You're using like some kind of tin 
thin film, holographic film um, that goes over the edge of the glass and um, sort of mimic what's happening on the display at the end of the glass so that it looks like it's basically a business um, display. What I thought was, really, what was fun about that is if you actually look at the Model 3, um, Model 3 has a large, of course, the center display, and it has relatively thick bezel on it. I, I feel like it's pretty big. Um, but we, we posted last year when Tesla was doing the refresh of the Model S, the, the, the refresh of the design of the Model S, um, the, um, we, we posted some design images of what they were working on, and that included, of course, moving to a more Model 3 similar design with minimalistic look and an horizontal center display. That display in the design was completely bezel-less. So I thought that was an interesting point to bring that. So it looks like the stuck is actually working to make that happen. That would be cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, these things often take a while. And you know, after covering Apple and Google, they kind of patent just about everything. But these things seem oddly specific uh, to Tesla's products. So it seems well, likely that... At the point, not necessarily because in the patent application, there's not actually any mention of cars or anything like that. There's just displays. And in the drawings, they actually use images of mobile phones and, and, and tablets to discuss it. Yeah, I mean, the idea, I guess, of patents for a lot of companies, supposedly not Tesla, but maybe now Tesla, is that uh, they can monetize, monetize and weaponize those patents when other companies yeah. come after them. And, and you know, I mean, clearly Samsung has a product that does a similar thing and already out in the wild. So maybe Tesla found out found a new way to do getting the pixels to the uh, edge, and uh, you know somewhere down the line Apple wants to do this, and Tesla can say, "Hey, that's our you know our thing. Give us a bunch of money." I don't know if that's really the motivation, but certainly an option. Well, Tesla has uh, been very openly against some type of a patent trolling, which is not exactly what you just described, but similar. Anyway, I would like to see that in Tesla's future cars, for sure. Moving on, Porsche, the, the Taken. So they started production last month. They unveiled the car last month. They started production a week later. And now they're talking about increasing production capacity, something they've been talking about for a while now. The original uh, capacity was supposed to be 20,000 cars a year, which uh, for Porsche is, is pretty good because... I mean, Porsche is a big name, but in, in volume, they are relatively small. So 20,000 car per year, it was a big vehicle program for them. However, they've been, um, they, they claim to, to see higher demand than they originally anticipated. They've been saying that for a while. <laughs> so they've been saying that before, before unveiling the car. And what happened with unveiling the car, I think it was well received by most people. People liked it, like it, it looked super cool. It looked almost just as cool as the prototype did. Specs are very good, though, of course, uh, most Tesla fans are comparing it to the Model S, and it doesn't compare very well. But I think that, that, that I don't think that would affect them in a, as much. I think a bunch of people just want a Porsche, and if they, they have an electric option, it's cool. Uh, so plenty of people would just never buy a Tesla for whatever reason. So to have another sports sedan, well, uh, Model S is not uh, could could be considered also a family sedan because of its size, not the Porsche though, but performance wise, it's also a sports sedan. So it's nice to have an alternative. So I think that doesn't affect Domin as much. What I think I forget Domin when the car was unveiled, I don't know about you, but the price was surprising a little, a little bit to me. Like the, it was higher than I thought. So I think I thought that that might have turned around some people that actually at first reserved the car or I don't think I can even say reserve because they, they had some kind of, they, they called it like a show of interest for the car. So they called people prospective buyers, not reservation holders or pre-orders or anything like that. Um, but apparently they still said after the unveiling that they had uh, 30,000 people sign up to, to, to buy the taken. So wow. that, that's good. It's a year uh, and a half. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A year and a half based on the original production capacity which they are apparently increasing now. They announced this week that they are hiring 500 more people to work out of the Zuffenhausen uh, factory. 
where they are producing it. And uh, so that brings a total to 2000. So that's all they're talking about it. They're not talking about what's the actual new volume capacity. They're talking just about jobs. Uh, but they do say that it is, it, it's not because they, they just now realize that they need more people to produce the 20,000 cars. It's because they, they want to increase the, cap the, the overall capacity. So that's good news. But I find it weird that they're talking about it just in the job perspective because, of course, you don't just need more people. You need more batteries. You need more all of the components. And especially the batteries, I think, are often the bottleneck. So I would have liked to hear about that. So I'm thinking that maybe even Porsche doesn't know exactly how many they can produce. Like they were planning for 20,000, but now they want to do more. They're willing to hire people to do more, but there might be other bottlenecks here. So that might be why we don't have a new um, exact production capacity. Moving on to Volvo. So last week was exciting. Volvo finally announced that they're unveiling the uh, XC40. Uh, the all electric version of the XC40, I have to say, because they have other version already on the market. But if it's not all electric, we don't care about it. So the, the XC40 had, is their most popular car, right? I think it's the second most popular car. Okay. Yeah. But it, it's up there. I think it's like 80,000 80, units a year right now. They are hats or something like that. So it, it is a significant legal program for, but it started as it's cheap too. It's like, it's in the uh, low 30,000 or something. So for a Volvo. Pretty good. Uh, yeah. So last week they announced they're going to unveil it on October 16. And they teased the safety capacity of the car. Of course, safety is a big thing for Volvo. They've been known for that. Um, this week they unveil a bunch of teaser images, just design drawings though. But they also confirm a few features of the car, including the fact that it's going to have a full front, a full 30. Uh, 30 liter is that all you call it yeah uh, 30, yeah 30 liter front trunk so they gonna have that they confirmed the design of the front end which is always a big deal for uh, when a, a, a automaker is going into all electric vehicles because they're used to having the grill and so what are is, is going to be their their approach to the grill uh in an all electric car volvo's approach is very similar to Tesla's original approach with the nose cone thing, where this, there's still a form of a grill there, but it's being uh, replaced by a solid uh, panel of the same body color as the car. So not exactly like Tesla's approach, because Tesla had like a, a demarker for the for the grill, where they, with which we call a nose cone, but that was a different color from the rest of the car. And Volvo is going to be the same color. So that's interesting. We've seen similar things like um, the Kona. Right. And the Nero, they have a demarcation to show where it should be a grill, but there's not like an actual grill there. Um, so a similar thing there. So we, actually, we've seen a lot of people do that when they have a car that exists in uh, another version of uh, another powertrain. So they have a gas powertrain, they have an electric powertrain, and they do keep the same design, so they do keep the same grill, but the it's either a fake one inside or it's just covered or anything like that so they're doing that um so do you think this, also do you think yep. this is plastic or metal <clears throat> or it's probably plastic it's like the bumper it's like in front of <clears throat> the, well it's not yeah. the bumper it's a bump, but most likely plastic in my opinion i mean there's I no mean, see like people, no um like mercedes uh, eqc has a weird like uh, textured plastic on the mm -hmm. grill, right? So it's not it's not uncommon exactly. They did confirm uh, also the wheels option, nineteen and twenty inch wheels. So pretty standard there. They say it's going to be offered in eight exterior colors, including a sage green option. Uh, so okay. now you know. And standard, the roof is gonna come as a contrasting black. Is that that I like though? I like when cars do that. When they, they have a like a, like like a, a white car with a black roof. I like that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah like a two tone. Yeah, I like that. So that could be cool. 
All right, so we, we're still we're gonna have probably more to say next week about it. They are doing that thing where they just trickle down some information leading to the unveiling. So we're gonna probably learn more about uh, the specs probably next week, and then the week after that is gonna be the actual unveiling of the car, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I love the form factor, like I said last week. And everything. The only thing really I'm concerned is, is the price, and that's not always my fear when you have a car, a multi powertrain platform, because but already, I can go out right now and buy a XC40 gas for a car for $33,000 in the US. So if someone is on the market for a car like that and doesn't necessarily care about electric or not, like they, they might consider it electric, but they're also like, man, they're on the, on, on the fence or something. But they're like, oh, I'm falling in love with the XC40. I want to buy an XC40. Then if they see an XC40 at $33,000 and then they see an XC40 at $50,000, which one do you think they're going to take if they were on the fence about electric? They're going to go with a gas card one. Right. So I think $40,000 would be a good price point. Uh, as close yeah. to forty dollars as possible because you get the the uh, federal tax credit, which kind of brings it in line. Definitely. Volvo still has that for sure. Um, but the, the other thing is uh, you need a good salesman for it. Like if you have a good salesman, they could they, they could sell to you the difference in pricing. They could tell you like uh, uh, gas savings and um, maintenance savings and, and, and whatnot. But of course, gas salesmen in uh, legacy automaker dealerships are they're far and few in between. They're, they're horrible. I uh, so my Chevy Bolt lease is coming up due three years. Uh, and they've been emailing me and of course like you know how dealerships have you on like a, a list and they just call you and call you and call you until you, until you tell them yeah. to go away so anyway i was in i was nearby the the dealership and i was like all right i'll just go in and see what they say because re really we know that gm doesn't have any other evs coming very soon like within a couple of months the new bolt yeah. 2020 is going to be 259 miles and uh i'm actually going on a, a drive next week uh, to see what else is new, if anything else is new, or just maybe how the, the longer drivetrain works or something. I don't know. I'm going out. Uh, maybe I'll like it and maybe I'll upgrade to that. But I, I went back to my GM dealer. dealer um, and I was, about it, right? <laughs> or sorry, the Chevy Chevy dealer. What's that? I bet they didn't know anything about it, about the 2020. Oh, yeah. So they didn't know anything about the 2020. That was almost a given. Not surprising at all. But um, the guy I talked to was like, oh, I don't think the Bolt's going to be around much longer. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, is there going to be? And he's like, I don't know. I just hear things. Um, and of course, he tried to sell me like a truck. And a, ah, a, oh, no. Uh, and he's like, you know, one of the things about the Bolt that people don't like is that there's no room in the back. You need you need some more room. We got, we got covered. You have a big customer that comes in your store and he's like, I like this product. Apparently something, a new version of it is coming out. The guy just start uh, listing bad things about that product instead. Makes no sense. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Well, I mean, it does if what you have in inventory is a bunch of trucks. Not right. Sense. Or if uh, the Chevy Bolt people haven't come back in three years because they don't need oil changes and brake pad upgrades yeah, and all that other stuff. Good point, good point. So I, I'm seeing that every time I ask GM about it, they're like, no, don't worry. The dealers are incentivized to sell electric vehicles. Uh, no, they're not. They, they're just not. They need to start a new sub brand called Saturn and sell only electric vehicles. Yeah, that, that you've been pushing that for a while. I yeah, think. It's not happening, but I'm going to push it again next week. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that. I agree that when, when you have um, this big, this huge legacy business of selling gas power train, it's just not the same at all as selling electric vehicles. And uh, yeah, dealership are being, they are, I, I hate talking about like general terms like that, just dealership, because I know some of oh, them that are very, yeah, some, some very like it, like especially uh, we don't want in, in, in Quebec a GM dealership too. Right. Um, uh, they sell like the half, half the bolts everywhere. Like yeah, they, 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 absurd they, amount. They sell of bolts. more bolts more bolt than anyone on the market. These the 
we didn't have the Spark EV. They imported Spark EV from the U.S. and sold them in, in Quebec before they were available. Um, they, they 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 were very good. I, I, now I want to I want to I forgot the name of it. It's like an English name, but in Quebec, in the middle of Quebec. Um, uh, I'm sorry, guys. I forgot. I'm, I'm googling it. Yeah. Uh, it's actually there's, not far, there's not that far from where my parents live. It's an R. It starts with R. I'm not on the comments on YouTube. I'm sure some people on YouTube are like screaming the name right now. Let's see. Nope. No, no one's. <laughs> uh, a third of this dealer's sales are Chevy Volts. Bur uh, bourgeois? Bourgeois? Uh, yeah, Bourgeois is good, but there's another one. Oh, no. Where, where is the Bourgeois dealership? I might I might be confusing it with the name of the town. Uh, Rodden. Rodden. Okay, no, yeah. that, that's them. Okay, that, it's Bourgeois, uh, Jim Bourgeois, or Chevy Bourgeois? Is it Chevy Bourgeois? Chevy, yeah. Chevy Bourgeois in Rodden. Uh, those guys, they sell a ton of EVs and they're completely on board. So I know they're not allowed to, and all the other dealership are, are excited about EVs. Yeah, particularly on the West Coast, I know uh, there's a lot of uh, dealers that are on board. Here in New York, uh, two Chevy dealers I went to were both garbage. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. There, there, there's it is um it is an area where they could improve a lot i just i just don't see how because of the the way it's they're incentivized they're incentivized to 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 sell cars and brakes which is crazy because they do make a lot of money on service and of course they incentivize to sell what's on their lot and they don't get that many inventory for electric, electric cars but that's Partly the fault of the automaker is because they don't make that many, and the the spread it out in markets where you need them for regulation. So in the U.S., that's carbs market, but it's also on a broader scale in Europe where they send they send more cars to Europe because especially now in the next uh, next year when um, those new EU regulations come into play and the automakers have to sell a lot more EVs. Uh, it's hard to find a solution for that. Yeah, it's a chicken or the egg problem. I guess what's going to have to happen is, uh, you know, what, what's happening with the premium uh, SUV makers like Audi and Porsche and, well, Porsche not SUV-ish maker, but um, premium car makers are getting their their uh, market, mar market uh, taken by Tesla and oh, the, uh, <laughs> and the uh, they're they're moving to electric uh, a little bit faster and they they have kind of premium electric cars so you kind of have to know that Tesla's in the the space theoretically uh, when Rivian or Tesla or somebody else comes out with an electric pickup truck they're going to have to start dealing with those because uh, that's what the customers I think in the long term will want. So I think that's that'll make the Chevy dealers not as garbagey as they currently are. That's oh yeah, for sure. Long, long term, that will happen. Long term, they will they will fall under under pressure. That there's no doubt about it. But I mean, in the short term, if we want to accelerate the the adoption, we 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 want the dealership on our side, and it's hard to get them on our side right now. Yeah, especially since the since Tesla is so. It, Tesla, like you said, is, is putting pressure on premium automakers, but it's also scaring them with their their business model of not going to the franchise dealership. Right. So it's like a, a they they are getting hit on both sides. Of course, Tesla is bringing another point by sh highlighting the fact that the franchise model is not that efficient in itself. Too, it was good for automakers early on because it alleviated them the cost of uh, of, of establishing service points and and um storefronts but nowadays it's not not necessarily as useful yeah and I, I i'm always thinking to myself like it must be tempting for tesla to say all right screw it let's just do dealerships because they buy out all their inventory ahead of time so like instead of tesla bearing the brunt of all that excess inventory the dealerships will have you don't know what to complain about too right uh they don't have to set up you know local 
teams or whatever that's all external it's all like i mean it's almost like having an outside entity it is like having an outside entity not having to deal with that so basically it would be a whole lot easier for tesla to have dealerships but um you know clearly that's one of the the pain points that they're trying to eliminate and and thank god because my experience with dealerships <laughs> like across the board uh you know particularly curry in new york if, if anybody's out there is listening but just ge generally speaking dealerships are have always been the worst thing ever um i don't yeah. know i don't know if everybody's like that but not that the experience with tesla was always been perfect either but no. you see a different mentality where the big difference too with tesla of course is that most of the car are still under warranties <laughs> Vast right. majority of the cars are still under warranty, so uh, that that makes a big difference when you don't have to pay for the actual service. To a degree, of course, different like maintenance and whatnot. But yeah, it, it is definitely a, a weird space to navigate. We we should look into um, other solution for getting the dealers on our side. Anyway, that's uh, that's us for this week, guys. Thanks a lot for listening uh, and watching on YouTube. Let us know what you think about having it at noon eastern time or whatever your time is right now for me of course keep in mind that for me right now it's six and uh, now it's almost seven so that's why we are making it a little bit earlier um so let us know and um thank you see you next time